and we'll get started. Okay, hopefully you can see the slide deck. Welcome everyone to the uh, Digital Technologies webinar series. So this afternoon, we're going to be looking at integrating DT plus X. I'm Sujata Gunja from the Australian Computing Academy. I'm also a lecturer uh, in the Master of Education Digital Technologies program at the University of Sydney. And with me today is um, Anna Kinein, uh, who is from the Queensland College of Teachers. She's the manager for the Digital Strategies program and also one of the four writers of the Australian curriculum. Uh, so she can handle all the curly and, and tricky questions that you have um, for her this afternoon. Uh, so we have quite a lot to get through in the next hour. When we were putting this webinar together, we thought we really could keep you all here uh, for the better part of the day, but I know that's not how much time you all have. So we're gonna quickly go through DT plus X. Uh, what does it all mean? Uh, a very brief overview of the digital technologies curriculum because there are some people who may not know how it all fits together. Uh, and the main thing that you're here for, lots of curriculum examples, integrating digital technologies and other learning areas, and uh, what you might need to think about when we think about DT plus X and the teaching and learning that goes with it. So with that being said, I'm going to hand over to Anna. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Sujatha. Can I just check in with everyone that they can just see the slide that Sujatha is referring to and not the ones that are coming up because I can see all the ones. Oh, up. right. So it's the other one, is it? Just checking. It might just be me. No, 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 Sujatha. Go back to where you were. I'm just I can that. see the slides scrolling through. through. And, can and I can see the next slide and all the yes. other slides down the bottom. It's in the, uh, you need to it's be the other way around. Mode if you can get out of that. Yep, that's it. Beautiful. Thank that's you. what you want. Thank Excellent. you. <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone and thank you Sajatha. Um, and thanks for your patience while we were sorting out some of our technical um, challenges with our um, online environment. So as Sajatha said, I am one of the writers of the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies Learning Area. And it's the gift that keeps on giving. We started that process in 2010. And I'm really excited um, to be able to support teachers and school leaders across uh, the nation as they implement this curriculum. I just noticed we've got someone with their mic on. Um, could we ask that you mute your mic, please? Thank you, that's great. All right, so what we're going to be doing this afternoon is having a bit of a general chat, as Jarka said, about the curriculum, but also about ways that you are able to connect with the other learning areas and the ICT general capability. Now, just to, um, I suppose, start us off, one of the benefits of being in the primary setting is as primary teachers, you have access to your students predominantly for most of the day, and you are also in most settings delivering the other learning areas. So you are very perfectly positioned to be able to deliver the Digitech curriculum in alignment with other learning areas. Now, the reason that I use the word alignment is because we really want to avoid an integration where we've got three or four different learning areas all together with Digitech where we lose the integrity of the discipline. We don't want that to happen. So I, Sajatha and I are in agreement that we would probably, um, I suppose, um, suggest that Digitech be aligned with one and two other learning areas, preferably no more than that. So thanks Sajatha, I'm going to have to ask you to move to the next slide, beautiful. All right, so some of the um, challenges I think that people face when uh, delivering a new curriculum, particularly Digitech, is where do I fit this in? Now, in the primary setting, you guys are probably already doing a lot of things that have a natural alignment or would be, I suppose, best a best fit for Digitech. And we're going to take you through some of those examples um, this afternoon. Now, it would be remiss of me if we did not start our conversation to, in the, I suppose, positive nature of what a wonderful curriculum this is, but we do, I do want to address some of the myths and misconceptions that abound with this curriculum. Now, 
as the curriculum has been implemented across Australia in different stages with different states having different timelines and different approaches, we've noticed as uh, writers some very common mis uh, misconceptions and myths surrounding what this curriculum is and what it isn't. So thanks, Sajatha. Let's start with the first challenge, and that is this curriculum is not about the technology. Now, I will, uh, I'm very aware that we've got participants in our group who are uh, very, very familiar with the Digitech curriculum and some who are new to this space. But the key message, no matter where you are positioned in your journey, the technology is not and should never be the focus. What we're talking about is the curriculum and not the devices and the digital systems, whilst it is important and relevant that our students develop skills and capacities to use the technology, the curriculum is definitely not about all the shiny bells and whistles. And we're going to share some examples where you can do quite a lot. In fact, 50% of this curriculum can be enacted in unplugged learning experiences. And that means you don't even have to be connected to a device. Thanks, Sajatha. So whilst it's important that our teachers have access to the resources and technologies they need, the most important thing is that we have the confidence, our teachers have the confidence to deliver this curriculum and provide engaging and authentic learning experiences. Now, the reason I've got this slide here is that the, the Primary teachers in our audience will know that this is the first time in our history that we have ever had to teach a brand new curriculum. I taught in the primary setting for over 22 years and I had never been asked to teach a new learning area. But digital technologies is a discipline, a new learning area. What we need to make sure if you've got um, positions in your school where you're supporting other teachers, that teachers have access to PD and that it's not okay to just say, well, I don't know about this. What is okay is to put your hand up and say, listen, I don't have enough understanding or I need some skills and some um, help in delivering this new curriculum. Thanks, Sajatha. Go to the next one. Yep, and can you click again? Thank you. Great. Okay, so another challenge that we are faced with is the curriculum literacy. So not just the naming of this discipline, but some of the terminology used throughout the Australian curriculum that causes confusion for quite a few um, people, not just teachers. Thanks to Jartha. So we're just going to unpack that. First and foremost, you are all very aware that in the Australian curriculum, we have our um, capabilities. Now, the ICT capability has its natural home in the digital technologies discipline, just as literacy has its natural home in English and numeracy has its natural home in mathematics. But ICT, our students need to be ICT capable to be able to engage with the digital technologies curriculum, obviously. But as we are very aware, there are some parts of the ICT capability that sit beautifully within our discipline. Thanks to Jatha. Okay, now I'm going to acknowledge my colleague, Paula Christofferson, who is one of the other writers of the uh, Digitech curriculum. And if I could get you to click again, Sajatha, um, this graphic is a really, um, I suppose, useful way to articulate what it is and what it isn't. So you're probably all very au okay fait with this. The ICT capability is about the students being effective users of the technology. The discipline, is where we are asking our students to be the developers of digital solutions. And we're gonna talk very briefly about those digital solutions shortly. Thanks to Jatha. Now, if, if our, I suppose our um, way of defining this curriculum, digital technologies with a capital D and capital T as a discipline name, caused a lot of confusion because prior to the Digitech curriculum being written, the other learning areas were written first. And as you can see, there is a very a, a diverse range of ways that digital technologies, lowercase and ICT, is represented in our learning areas. So that in itself causes some confusion because then we are 
faced with a discipline that is now called digital technologies, but is not about devices and not about digital systems alone. Thanks to Jartha. So now we've talked about what the curriculum isn't, let's just have a quick look at what it actually is. So as you're all aware, the learning area technology is divided into two subjects, design tech and digi tech. Now, whilst there are some commonalities, digital technologies is quite distinct and discreet and different to design and technologies. The writers, we were writing at the same time, but writing different content. Thanks to Jartha. Now, if one thing I suggest you've got to, if you had to ask me what this curriculum is about, the core of this curriculum, there's a definition for you. But if I could get you, Sajapa, just to do a couple of more um, and two more, yep, this is a nice way of explaining the difference between ICT capability and digital technologies discipline. And the discipline itself is aimed to, in, to ensure that Australian students develop the concepts, the fundamental concepts of computer science. Okay, so that might be a way um, to support um, those teachers who are still having a little bit of um, difficulty understanding the difference. Thank you, Sajatha. All right, now I'm going to, I don't want to rant. <laughs> Sajatha and I um, are very well, um, I suppose, we, we, we're very, we're on the same page when it comes to STEM and STEM initiatives. I just want to make it really clear that um, throughout the country in a lot of different uh, jurisdictions and school settings, we see some great things happening with STEM. But can we just remind you that STEM is an acronym. STEM is not a learning area. STEM is not a subject. It is an interdisciplinary approach where um, people have decided that due to the, the duration of time or the limitations of time, it might be better to approach um, some of these learning areas in a combined way. Now, if I could just get you, Sajatha, to go to the next slide. STEM does not equal digital technologies curriculum. So obviously, science, mathematics and technology have always been learning areas in our primary settings. Engineering doesn't even make an appearance in Digitech and it's a small concept, uh, context within the design and uh, technologies learning area. But whilst I'd just like you to be cognizant and to be mindful that if there are STEM initiatives happening in your school or you are running projects, I want you to have a good look at the mathematics. Is it that concepts, deep mathematical concepts are being um, taught and assessed or is it a lot of numeracy? Is it a lot of doing things? Similarly with science, what are the actual science concepts being taught and developed? And just because there's a STEM initiative does not mean, necessarily mean, that Digitech is being delivered in the correct way. In saying that, there's probably some fantastic teachers and schools who are doing the right thing in this space. Thank you, um, Sajatha. Okay, if I can give you one piece of advice, and you've probably already done this, I would really recommend you read the rationale and the aims. Reading the content descriptions or the achievement standard independently of the entire curriculum can for some people, uh, I suppose, cause a few problems because it's not a checklist of this content description has been covered and we've, we've focused on this part of the achievement standard. Thank you, um, Sujatha. And by the way, the rationale took us a long time to write. And I remember thinking, I wonder if any teacher's going to read this. All right, so as you're aware, we have two strands in all of our learning areas. In Digitech, there's no difference. However, the writers, we weren't fans of this approach because as you are aware, in Digitech, most of this, uh, most of the learning occurs in the doing. And we would have probably preferred the processes to take forefront in our, um, or, or in the way we describe the curriculum. Just to note that, the design tech terminology refers to investigating, generating, producing, and in Digitech, the focus is on the defining, designing, and implementing. So that's just something, a nice little point of difference. All right, the other thing that I highly recommend, and good luck trying to find it on the Australian Curriculum website, but the PDF documents, the scope and sequence charts are going to be beneficial for those of you that haven't already 
found them because they demonstrate is every in every teacher's setting when you're differentiating you're never going to have one group of students all um, at the same level um, if you are you are very lucky have a look at what's coming what was um, taught before or what the expectation was prior to your year level and of course what are we working towards and our curriculum has been um, divided up into bands year level bands so f to two we've got three years to consolidate those concepts etc so from the primary we're going from foundation to year six thank you Sajatha. all right now this is something that we'd like to share with you because it's not obvious but the that this curriculum was written around 10 key concepts now the 10 key concepts are not forefronted, you can't see them anywhere except woven through the content descriptions quite discreetly. Thanks to Jartha. On this slide here, you'll see the 10 key concepts. Now this has come directly, this slide, from the ACA uh, website. Most of you are probably familiar with that website, but I love the way that it, when you go to the website and you investigate these concepts, even the content descriptions on the website have um, are colour coded and parts of the content description that um, align to or refer to these key concepts are colour coded. So what we're going to do this afternoon is we're going to spend some time on a few of these concepts. So Sajatha, if I could just get you to pop to the next. Thank you. So we've only got a very a small amount of time today. So Sajatha and I um, have Put together some curriculum examples that whilst they align to several key concepts we're going to focus on these four and please don't think that just because you're delivering a learning experience um, in digitech that it's, oh, it's just about algorithms or it's just about the implementation or digital systems as you'll see some of these learning experiences lend themselves to a few of the key concepts and you need to be savvy making those connections and your critical or your cur curriculum literacy will come to the forefront here. Thanks, Sajatha. All right, so what I've done here is I've put the algorithm concept um, at the top and you can see from the scope and sequence how these content descriptions align to this concept. Now, if you were starting in F2, you can see exactly what's expected of you there. And as we progress across and from the band levels, we develop the more complex understandings of this particular concept. And now we're going to, thanks to Jartha. All right, this is just the way that um, Paula and I have used a diagram to demonstrate that um, development of this one key concept as we progress. And we'll get to the curriculum examples very shortly. And implementation, same thing. I'm just bringing you, uh, making you aware of the way that these concepts align to specific content descriptions, because when we share our examples, we'll be talking about implementation and algorithms and digital systems so that it might not be as obvious when you're looking at the particular um, content description. Thank you, Sajatha. And this is a lovely diagram that James has created and it just demonstrates at the onset, at what juncture or at what band level, there is a difference. So as you can see with um, implementation, when we're looking at programming, from F to two, we've got all of our students engaging with some physical programming. So they might be playing around with their B-bots or their um, Spiros, or they might be even just using their own, um, I suppose, objects in their classroom to do some fun programming. But as you can see, when we get to year three, four, we start to use the visual programming and that particularly Scratch, Blockly. And the focus is on branching, making decisions. Then we get to year four, five, six, and the point of difference in implementation here is that we start to talk about iteration, repetition, and so on and so forth as we move across the years. Thanks, Sajatha. Beautiful. Here's just a graphic of some of the um, block coding that students um, engage with, an example of Scratch and Blockly. And, uh, and last week, I listened to Nicola's wonderful Scratch um, webinar. So those of you that haven't um, listened to that, I highly recommend it because she does a brilliant job of explaining how Scratch can be and should be used effectively in the Digitech curriculum. Can I just mention too and reiterate what Nicola said? There's a lot of Scratch 
fests going on out there. And while it's fun to click and play with the blocks, that always remember the integrity of the Digitech curriculum. What, it, what is it that the students need to be knowing and understanding about the digital technologies curriculum while they are building their programs and their codes? And in one example, it might just be one simple part of the Digitech curriculum that covers quite a few, that takes quite a few lessons or learning experiences. Thanks, um, Sajatha. All right, now this graphic just demonstrates for you the algorithm strand and the algorithm concept. What are the specific things in F2 that you need to make sure you provide these learning opportunities for your students to engage in? So F2, it's the physical carrying out of steps, giving instructions, receiving instructions, starting to consider um, procedure and being really efficient with those instructions, concise e explanations and concise um, delivery of instructions. And then as you can see, we move through um, the progressions. We're going to refer to this diagram as we go, uh, as we share our curriculum examples. Thanks, Sajatha. And now we're going to talk about some curriculum examples. Can I just um, emphasize again, we don't want a curriculum example or a learning experience that is a mile wide and an inch deep. It's really preferable to have one learning area aligned. So you're in a learning area context, but Digitech is the concept or there's a focus within Digitech that you're trying to um, deliver or teach. Now, with the BeBots, as you know, there are so many links to the curriculum here. Even just literacy, directional language, preppies, learning what forward, backward, left, right means, even just um, some fun, um, conversations about um, the different terms that we could be using. Thanks, um, Sajatha. I like to use the strand in maths, the measurement and geometry stand when students are starting to look at position and movement. Beautiful alignment with our BeBots. So we can get the BeBots, uh, the students can start to get the BeBots to uh, move in different directions, discuss and use those literacies and those um, words that they're starting to develop in their language. Thanks, Sajatha. And again, here's just an example. You could use your BeBots for um, getting the students to do some skip counting. I've seen teachers use BeBots in um, geography, moving from one continent to the other. Um, perhaps even uh, playing games on um, a big grid, um, moving uh, the BeBot to spell out particular different words that you might have on spelling lists. Thanks, Sajatha. All right, let's go to history. Now, as you know, in the F2 history curriculum, it's all about the um, center of the student's world, about them and changes in their, their particular um, own family and themselves. Here's a lovely alignment to Digitech when we are following and describing and representing sequences of steps. So this is just ordering images in a sequence of personal events or milestones. So first tooth, when I first started to crawl, Students can arrange these images in a PowerPoint. You can give them slides to mix things up and they can um, try to sequence events. It doesn't have to be events about um, themselves, but um, this is just a nice alignment to history. If I get Sajatha now to pop to the next slide, and I'm not sure that this is going to work, but what we've done here is I'm going to um, credit my friend Paul Hamilton and we'll give you the resource to this a bit uh, at the end of this, but this is a beautiful way that ICT capability can be um, aligned here because what we've done is we've got the students, um, in this case, Paul has his photos, lined them up and using the free AR Maker app through some augmented reality, the students are able to demonstrate their sequence in a little movie. And I'll get to Jatha just to play that for us. Oh, it's probably not working. Is it working, Sajatha? I'm saying it's playing. Oh. No worries. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. Here we go. So what's happening is um, this particular set of images is just um, someone, well, Paul in this case, um, just demonstrating sequence from birth right up to where he is now. But that that is a really simple um, activity. And so I've sent Sajapa the link to Paul's little tweet. It's on, web, on um, YouTube and it's only about five minutes and you will be surprised. It's done through Keynote and mm -hmm. the AR Maker app and 
um, lots of fun doing it. I think it's really engaging. Thanks, Sajatha. Similarly, with fairy tales um, and, you know, F to two, you can use any fairy tales, getting students to actually retell the events within a fairy tale. So, you know, is it important that the events are in order? Is, does it matter if we mix up uh, the order of events? And these are the conversations that we'd like you to be considering when you're talking to the students about order and sequence and making sure that um, they do understand that order is important, particularly when we're talking about programming. All right, this is another little example, and you probably are all aware of Telegami. It's another free little app. But the reason I put this here is because there's so many different examples of sequences that you probably um, could use within your uh, lessons. James always likes to do the demo with the, the Vegemite sandwich. And what we can do here is ask the students to write a set of instructions for cleaning teeth or preparing to play a game using PlayStation or making a sandwich. And Sajatha, would you like to just jump in here with your um, example when you were saying, talking about um, the efficiency of the instructions? Yeah, so one of the things you can do with students is ask them to write down the steps. Uh, they might take maybe 10 uh, steps to describe how to clean their teeth. Uh, and if, they if you want to give them a challenge, ask them to make it in maybe six steps or under. Uh, ask them to maybe uh, use only f three steps. And then if they're really, really ready for it, uh, ask them to use uh, no letters, but maybe describe it using pictures. So uh, you can actually hit a lot of the different areas of the curriculum. So more than just sequencing of steps, uh, you're also able to bring in some of the data representation ideas uh, in the F2 curriculum and doing it in a way that is so integrated into that one area and also differentiates for students uh, depending on their familiarity and comfort with using language. Thank you, Sajatha. And that little telegami is just a different way to get the students to present their instructions because that's a nice um, alignment with the ICT capability. And that avatar, if you haven't used telegami, you can change the hair, you can change the color of the clothes. Um, the girls can pretend to be boys if they want to or vice versa. It's a really cool little app. Thanks, Sajatha. Yeah. Okay, so now we're just progressing to the year three, four juncture, and we're going to be looking at that point of difference, which is branching. So I've got a nice little example here, and this is my favourite one. I love the history um, unit that you are probably familiar with if you are a teacher of year four. When the students are learning about the stories of the first fleet, and particularly uh, the convicts, who were the convicts? Why were they transported? Now, if you haven't already been on the convict database, I highly recommend it because it is a brilliant teaching tool and a, I suppose a resource that can be used across so many different um, aspects and concepts of Digitech. So this one I'm going to share with you here is after the students were, well, they're in the context of history, they're learning about the convicts and um, something I learned that most convicts, in fact, 99% of them were transported for seven years, but no one ever really went back. So what I'd um, suggest you could do here is get the students, and in this case, create a little quiz to find out what their peers actually know or um, remember after they have finished their unit. But this is the context of history, but you are teaching the Digitech concept and that content description there clearly defines what that is. And we're, we're remembering to put in some branching. So some decisions need to be made in your Scratch program. And again, this particular history unit, we can also start thinking about some digital systems because the students, as they're engaging in the database, thanks Sajatha, as they're interacting and navigating their way through here, we're also aligning to the English literacy strand, looking at digital texts, not just that, look at the interface and start having conversations about the interface. Is it an easy, is it easy to use? Does the user actually know how to search? Um, and this particular database, I think you could do a lot with the ICT capability as well, but then you could start having those conversations about what is a database? How, where else in the school do you think we've got a digital system that is like a database? We could even create a database with the data in the um, attributes of students in the class. 
number of students with blue eyes, brown eyes, the number of boys, girls, etc. And I think Sajatha would like to, Sajatha, you've got something to share here as well. Um, yeah, so with this month, you can take your students to the library, uh, ask, ask the teacher librarian to uh, explain how they might look up books, how they might look up magazines. Uh, you could also set uh, those students who might be interested to go off to their local community library, obviously after uh, lockdown and all of that is finished. Uh, but there are a lot of opportunities for students, uh, even though they technically don't have to use, know the word database, uh, the fact is they're starting to connect these ideas that uh, information is distributed across uh, many locations and they can actually access it uh, through uh, either a web browser or any other type of software. So it's a nice way to connect uh, digital systems to the work that you're already doing in Year 4 history. Thank you, Sujatha. And I suppose the key message we're saying here is while you're in the context of a learning area, these skills and knowledges and capacities in Digitech can be reinforced and taught mm -hmm. and developed. Thanks, Sujatha. And this is just a nice little example of an ICT capability um, or even just a fun social media conversation. So who would the convicts have, um, or what were some of the images the convicts might have um, taken if they had access to Instagram? Um, who would their Facebook friends be? What would they have tweeted? Possibly help. This is just some fun other ways that you can integrate ICT and literacy and some of the English um, content descriptions. Thank you, Sajatha. All right, now this example, and I think there's another couple of clicks to go. Yep, if you could just click through that, Sajatha. This is now for our five teachers of year five and six, starting to have conversations. We're in the digital systems concept now, having conversations about the digital systems that they're engaging and interacting with. So instead of in our ICT capability, just using the technology, let's have a look. And as Sajatha so eloquently puts it, what's under the hood? So what's actually going on? We've got a whole range of digital systems that we engage with at school and at home. What are some of the things happening behind the scenes? And Sajatha, would you like to um, address this as well? Yeah, so this one, uh, again, you don't need to have much tech, uh, but just taking stock of what students are already using in the classroom, uh, whether it be um, laptops or tablets, there might be a data projector of some sort, there would be a printer somewhere, the library might have a, a kiosk uh, where students can type in what they want. Um, there might be a separate computer that the front desk has. Uh, so getting students to think about how do all these bits and pieces uh, communicate and talk to each other. And they really don't need to go into too much detail. We're not asking them uh, to become engineers at this point, but really just recognizing that these systems don't work in isolation, that there is some communication happening, uh, that data is being sent between the keyboard that I'm typing and it goes into my computer, which then does something and then it transforms it into the, uh, the text and the, um, the words that I see uh, on my on my monitor and if I hit print so there's something that happens there is still again some signals being sent that send it to the printer and so on so just understanding that flow of data is really the main uh, I guess the goal of digital systems in year five and six. Thank you Sajatha and that conversation about data really doesn't mean anything until we have it processed and made into some information information that makes sense to us. Thank you, Sajatha. All right, uh, while we're talking about digital systems, we've got a lot of um, teachers across the country engaging with drone technology. But again, instead of just having fun with the drones, let's have a look at how we can align to Digitech. And again, with our coding, but also um, I've got an example here in our mathematics curriculum. So for example, the drone in this curriculum um, example, if I could just get you Sajatha to move, Yep. So in this case, we're back in measurement and geometry, but this time we're in year three, four, and we're going to program the drone to follow the outline of a specific shape within set time limits. Now, this is a fun activity when we're looking at uh, interpreting information contained in maps, etc., in measurement and geometry. But I think the one thing I love about the drone technology um, or the way that teachers are able to use drones within their teaching and learning programs is the fact that for younger people, it's blatantly obvious if their program or um, code 
has a mistake in it somewhere because if the drone crashes or doesn't do what you expect, it's a fun way to then go, okay, let's go back and uh, revisit what we have, our sequence of steps. Thanks. And similarly, John. with any sort of, um, you know, robots, uh, you know, micro bit cars and so on, uh, it's a similar sort of philosophy that they need to program it to move. They need to be quite precise in the, uh, in the instructions that they use. Otherwise, it's not going to uh, drive the way that they want it to drive. Exactly. All right. So now we are looking at our year five, six um, band. And the point of difference here in our implementation is the iteration. So the repeated, um, and it eloquently says there, something multiple times until a condition is met. So if we could just go to the next slide, Sajatha. I love this example and, oh, look, Sajatha and I were talking about this today. That I, the reason I use this example is because I've only got two content descriptions here and there's so many other ways that this activity uh, can be used and you guys with your curriculum literacy will be able to make connections across other areas as well. But for the time being, if we have a look at the digital systems concept and, of course, looking at following simple algorithms and our branching and iteration. Now, this example also lends itself to the opportunity of having a look at barcodes and the way this data is represented and even considering what happens when I scan this. How does that machine um, self-checker actually, or self-checker actually know that this is a carton of milk and that it costs this much? So these really good conversations you can start to have. But the next slide also is an example of digital system interfaces. So if we have a look at this Coles interface. Now, I have to say, sometimes I get really frustrated and as Sajatha um, has said, you know, um, unidentified object or um, bag or what's the word, Sajatha? That, that... I was just typing it in, unexpected oh. item and bagging area. <laughs> I know. So what I would like to see is students having a look at some of these interfaces that um, we use in our everyday without even thinking, but start to really critically view that and say, look, you know what, if I'm a user, what's a little bit ambiguous about this interface or can we design it so it's a little bit more um, intuitive for the user? And I would love the fact that when I'm taking money out or withdrawing that there's a big bell or a ding or a noise that lets me know that, oh, you've forgotten to take your money from the um, little tray because I've often walked away without my cash. So here's a nice example of um, how this particular conversation about the checkouts at Coles can cover off on quite a few different um, concepts. And the next slide actually shows you one of these concepts. Oh, this is the barcode conversation, um, which we were just talking about. So we might just skip. Oh, the other thing on this one is um, also the fact that we have lots of interesting symbols to explore. It's not just the barcode. Um, it, we've got the recycling symbol. So you, if you have students in year five and six who might be working uh, at a lower year level, uh, you know, we can explore data representation here. Uh, it also has uh, connections to science here because they're going to be looking at um, ratios and um, the nutrition values in, at some point in science. So there's a lot of uh, data that here that students can look at uh, and understand what it actually means uh, and where it might be coming from and going to. I love that. Excellent. All right, so here's an example that you could do um, and another, it's an unplugged activity. So after you've had a conversation about the checkout, start to think about what sequence of steps might a computer use to work out the cost of the items at the checkout. So you can have this a whole class discussion or in small groups where they start to, you know, really think about this. So example, how would the program start? How does the system recognise an item? How will it keep tally of the cost? How will you know when you've recorded all your items? And how does the program end? So let's have a look at an unplugged activity. Here the students are using flow charts, pen and paper, just to start creating their algorithm and of course looking at the decisions that have to be made. And this is a really cool activity that can be done without a computer. The next activity or the next example here is we're now going to start thinking about implementing our algorithm. So in year five, six, we've got our content description there and I'm using a scratch example um, on the next slide. Thanks to Jartha. And this scratch example, okay, is just one example of many different things that you could do here. 
Um, and for some students who might just be beginning or, le or learning about Scratch, this might be way too complicated for them. You might choose to give them some of the code or give them some um, information that, that supports them in this, differentiate. There might be some students who are quite competent and able to do this on their own. Um, so, Jatha, you were speaking about this this afternoon. We had our chat. Yeah. Jump in. Yeah, so if you're looking at the code on, on the screen and thinking, uh, I, I don't think my students can do that, uh, don't forget, this is at the very end of the project, and this is one solution. Your students may well have uh, just a simple if statement, uh, and they, can, they, they may only be able to handle two products, and that's fine as well. So remember, there's lots of different ways the students can demonstrate learning in this, uh, and as Anna said, you might give them partially completed project. The other thing is, if the focus of an activity like this is their implementation and programming. You might want to give them the user interface. So the milk, the eggs, the cheese, uh, give that to them so that you're not um, uh, spending uh, two to three lessons with students just playing around with the buttons on the screen when you really want them to actually try uh, developing the code behind it. So uh, supporting their learning by uh, figuring out, okay, what is the pre-built or the, here's the thing I did earlier, uh, giving that to the students so that they really know uh, what what they should be spending their class time on uh, in terms of what is uh, the focus of your learning activity. Thank you, Sajatha. Beautiful. And this is your example as well. Yeah. So this is a um, this is an example that ties uh, to science in terms of algorithms. Um, I know my own children have. Um, had science experiments in the class where they monitored the health of a plant. They need to um, measure sunlight, uh, water, uh, make a decision about the plant's health, and even something like that. So your science procedures can be modeled as algorithms. So uh, I did a little experiment with my own child um, earlier this year when we were in lockdown, um, and we designed uh, some algorithms. So this is just a neater way uh, of representing uh, the algorithms that my son came up with. Uh, so again, providing uh, some of the scaffold for your students if they're not strong enough to do that, just so that they can see that this is not just about a particular problem, it's a way of modeling solutions to lots of different problems. Uh, and using uh, that, that language of algorithms to not just use it in digital technologies, but also to say, hey, you know what, you know, we can use this um, to quickly uh, picture or represent what my science experiment is going to be or what the procedure of my science experiment is going to look like. I love that example, Sujatha, and I'm going to steal it. <laughs> no, steal away, no problems. Okay, so um, I'll just get Sujatha, if you could just go, there's probably four clicks here for the, yep, yeah, okay. So these are the universal symbols used in flowcharts and I could think of a thousand different ways you could use flowcharts in your class and a cool one if I could just get Sajatha to, uh, thank you. So let's pretend we're in, uh, we're having a spelling lesson and we're looking at the rule for adding ing. And this is a very fun activity that every student in your class could um, engage with. If we just look at the response on the right side, um, and we'll just get you to click through, Sajatha. So what do we start with? We start with a verb. So the word make, does it end in E? So this is where we have to make a decision. If yes, remove the E, add ING. If no, add ING and write the new word. Okay, the next slide, and I know we're powering through this, but this is, if we had a little bit of time, we'd get you to have a go at this, but this is really fun. You could do this tomorrow with your class. What are the decisions and steps for two digit subtraction? So you're in mathematics and you've taught students how to borrow or trade or whatever terms you use when you're talking about um, subtracting two digit numbers. And then you start to think, hmm, how would I represent the steps involved using a flow chart? And here's one we prepared earlier. And the fun thing is having that, what is the decision that has to be made? And this is, is the top digit smaller? And the terminology here, trade, borrow, um, everyone understands what we're talking about. And if no, what happens? Straight down to subtract the ones, and then we have the new number at the bottom, or the answer, I should say. So a really cool, fun way to use flowcharts just in a mathematical um, context. Thanks, Sajatha. 
This is another activity, and this one I created is available on the Digitech Hub um, and the uh, URLs at the bottom, but I know that Sujatha will be sharing all the resources and the links to things with you later. But this is just a dare to square game where the students have a grid and they can verbally try to get their friend working in pairs to colour the squares following the instructions. So it, you'd really start with, um, you could start with a blank four by four grid and ask them to colour, or you could get them to um, do something using the, uh, the squares. But my idea is a blank grid, you're giving instructions to your friend, move one square right, colour, keep going, or whatever you want to, um, I suppose, uh, or however you want to share this with the students, you could do a whole array of things. But in the next slide, you'll see when you say, without speaking, how are you actually going to provide instructions to your friend if you're not allowed to talk to them or tell them? And this is a little algorithm using just arrows. And this is available um, in its entirety on the Digitech Hub. And very quickly rushing through this, here we've got links to English when students are um, engaging with fantasy texts, if that's a set novel. When they're um, in Digitech, they could be creating a game utilising aspects of the fantasy genre. Um, and the next slide, I think, is the media arts example where students, yep, again, it's the same um, aspect. They're engaging in a fantasy, they're reading or interacting uh, with texts of the fantasy genre, but this time they're in media arts. And you can see all of the content descriptions on the side there. Thanks to Jatha. Skipping through here, give you a geography example. All of those, all of you in year five, six know the disasters unit or the um, links to the curriculum where we're looking at um, natural disasters. So again, take advantage of that context. And in this case, we've got students creating um, on the next slide, thanks to Jatha, uh, quizzes for younger students to educate them about fallen power lines or coding a game for the local community in order to help them prepare, prepare for a severe weather event or even programming a boom gate to stop people from entering flooded roads. So just the context of geography and links to Digi. And again, with year uh, F to two in our history, beautiful way to start looking at digital systems because they're looking at technology past and present. And the next slide actually um, shows some of the examples. You could bring in some old phones with your students or just get images for them and have that conversation about why is it that we can now walk around with our phone and we're not tethered to the wall? What's happened? Why has the tech or how has the technology changed to enable us to use a smartphone? And looking at these <laughs> different, the digital system on the right, which is our laptop, and then looking at the typewriter and having those conversations about, wow, now the user of the uh, device on the right um, can simply, if they make a mistake, it's just a delete, you know, all these great conversations that we can have about digital systems and looking, and this is in history, looking at um, past and present. One of the things I did in a uh, year one classroom was uh, get the parents to send in um, bits of old tech that they had along with when they might have purchased it. So we just had dates or years on them. Uh, and as a class, we sequen sequenced them around the classroom. And it was part of a temporary display for about a week in the classroom. And the kids loved it. It was really, really hands-on. They could see all these things. Uh, sometimes they could play with it. And we could also see how the technology had evolved and the kids could make some observations about uh, the size, the functionality. Sometimes it's had screens. In the olden days, it didn't have screens and so on and so forth. Beautiful. Love it. And of course, we're talking about digital systems. So we can start to look at the software that the students are engaging in and interacting with and talking about the, the software as a digital system and that wanting to ask the students more about why, for example, if you want to present some particular report or event to the class, what software or what uh, tool best meets your needs. So for example, if you want to create a, a presentation, um, are you going to use iMovie or are you going to use PowerPoint or are you just going to use Word to um, create your report? But again, the conversation is about the system that the students are engaging in. 
and the tool that fits. And this, of course, is a nice ICT capability example as well. Thanks, Jonathan. Oh, sorry, it's gone. That's fine. And, and look, we'll just quickly, this is very, very, a, a quick run through. We're talking about data representation here in the preppy or even up to F2. These are really cool, fun things to do with a glyph where we're looking at history. And again, we're looking at the people um, in your family. So on the next slide, we're just asking the students to use coloured squares, and my squares don't look very square, but uh, to represent the people who live in the house. And then you could get the students to swap their houses and then try to identify how many sisters does um, Sajatha have, or how many um, grandparents are in the house, if any, or how many pets, etc. So it's a really cool way to start that data representation um, concept off in the early years. And the same sort of thing with the owl glyph. I really love this. And you can do a whole range of things here because this, this is a fun, the only difficulty is making sure that you've got all the parts and all the different colors. Um, but um, there is a link and I think um, Sajatha will share that with you so you can get all of yep. these resources from that website. And again, same thing, but this is using a gingerbread man. All right, now very quickly, we're just going to run through the data collection. Now this one is probably the easiest one for primary teachers to get their head around because you're already doing this in mathematics and in science. And this particular example I'm gonna share with you is a science one. Uh, oh, sorry, it's not. I think I was going to talk about the um, data detective, but well. Oh, I've moved this one. Yep, sorry. That's okay. Um, no, yep, no, 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 you're right. Is here. That's yeah, okay, it's here. Beautiful. Okay, so this is a nice little um, science alignment where the students are having a little investigation and finding out, it could also align um, to mathematics, when they're looking at um, finding out the most popular pet um, in the class or even in the school. So they do a little investigation, they're gathering some data, they might have some little surveys, they might actually go knocking on uh, classroom doors and finding out uh, or asking particular questions of the students. And then they're going to find a way to display and represent the information or the data that they've found. So on the next slide, for example, the question is, what is the most common pet? How will I find this information? And then off they go, they, get, they collect their data and then they start to represent it in different ways. Fun picture graphs, drawings, um, and this activity is called Data Detective and it's actually on the Digitech Hub. And again, just a couple of, um, images of what the students have come up with there. And if you really want to, you can go on to, you know, start looking at Excel spreadsheeting and do some cool things with the students as a, a combined um, whole class lesson. And I think Sajath is going to now chat to you about the alignment here to science. Yeah. Right, so lots of things that you might already currently be doing in science have a good tie-in with uh, digital technologies. So anytime the kids are using any type of scientific measurement instruments, particularly the electronic measurement instruments, uh, you can have a chat about the digital system. So if they're using uh, moisture sensors, any type, any type of electronic um, thermometers, temperature sensors, and so on. Um, so you can really talk about uh, what sort of data it might be collecting, um, whether it can show you temperature in Celsius, Fahrenheit, uh, again, talking about different ways of representing the same data. Uh, in five and six, uh, we've got some activities uh, on the site. You may have already seen this before. Maybe you've already used it as well. Uh, so we can start to look at how we uh, group and sort things. So the idea of sort, sorting and classifying is a really big uh, concept in digital technologies and it uh, ties beautifully to what the expectations are in science. So one of our activities is uh, sorting living and non-living things uh, based on their physical characteristics. So we have some really nice unplugged activities. Uh, we've got some cards as well so you can play with those. Um, we also have the smart garden project. So for in five and six, again, our students design um, a series of experiments to uh, monitor the health of a plant using uh, the microbit. So these are little um, mini computers. They're about 20 to $25. Uh, but if you don't have them in your classroom, we have a course online that's already got a simulator built in. Um, so they can use the uh, microbit to collect a whole bunch of data. Again, it ties in really nicely with the data collection, but there's also some of the programming and implementation that goes with it. So uh, this is a little bit of what the activity looks like. It's got um, some worksheets. It's got uh, a, a 
a handbook that students can actually go and design and collect data and do some uh, basic data analysis. So it's a really nice little thing uh, if you're looking for a more self-contained little project. So all of our resources are on the ACA website, so you can have a uh, look at them. Um, there's lots there. Uh, all our key concepts have been broken down uh, on the ACA website. If you go to the curriculum unpacking section, I posted the link earlier on chat. Uh, so have a look at that because it's got lots and lots of examples uh, to really guide you uh, to understand the intent of the curriculum and help you program it in a way that uh, allows you to make the most use of your uh, time with the students in the class. Uh, so these are some of the unplugged activities that you can download. Uh, and yeah, this comes back to the classification. So there's some tables so students can think about how they might classify it and based on that, uh, create some decision trees. So again, this is uh, those decisions that we make in terms of um, if it has a pouch, it might be an echidna or a kangaroo. If it doesn't have a pouch, it might be these animals. And then you can talk about uh, subclassifications and so on. So at the F to two and even three to four, they don't need to formally uh, use the language of if in algorithms, they can actually represent the algorithms diagrammatically like this as well. So this is a nice way, uh, and you might be doing this already with other animals and activities, uh, in which case uh, you're already integrating digital technologies um, uh, with, with, with your learning area. Um, so we've got a small poll. I think we might, we've got four minutes left. I might need to skip this because I think uh, we'll come back to this at the end if we have some time. So I just want to quickly go through what good DT plus X might look like. Now, some of these points um, we've just sort of chatted about in the office, but really what we want uh, to see is that the learning goals have been clearly identified in terms of what you're going to be achieving in DT uh, plus the other uh, learning area. So framing your learning intentions like students will be able to explain this, understand this, demonstrate this, uh, develop this and so on. Um, the next point is consider the balance of digital technologies and whatever your other learning area is. Um, if there's lots and lots of science, but the link to digital technologies is fairly superficial, uh, then it may not necessarily be a DT plus X project. And that's fine, uh, but make sure that uh, you call it the thing that it really is. Um, giving it multiple points of entry and exit, so differentiating uh, all of you are teachers, you know what differentiation looks like. Uh, it can be a lot harder to achieve it in practice sometimes because you could potentially have kids who are working at a band level below and a band level above. So thinking about ways to bring those kids on board uh, and having ways for students to sort of go off uh, and explore some of the more complex ideas uh, would be great. Um, look for authentic integration, but there is always a temptation to cram too much into it. So uh, we call it scope creep. Uh, so just be aware of that. There's, um, there's lots you can do, but starting off uh, with small sort of integration ideas is really the best way to start because then you can actually measure uh, the impact of what you're doing. Uh, this one is quite important. Um, we know that mix of teaching strategies is essential, but sometimes uh, what we've seen is DD plus X, uh, students get turned on um, to a computer and saying, right, go and explore Scratch for the next lesson. Um, Play-based learning is great, but there needs to be scaffolding. And at some point there needs to be direct instruction. I think there's a little bit of a tendency uh, to sort of think di direct instruction is not ideal. I think for the right thing, um, it's absolutely necessary to do that, particularly when you're explaining concepts that not all students may get because it's a little bit abstract. Uh, and thinking about your assessment as well. So like we said, some of these take home messages that we want to leave you with, just be aware of cramming too much. Uh, it makes life hard for the students and it makes life really hard uh, for you as a teacher. So start small and when it's successful, think about what else you might do to make it better. Um, the next one is think about the sufficient time. So if I want to my students to create this fabulous uh, user interface for a supermarket, um, is it enough that I'm giving them only three lessons when they've never touched Scratch before? So that balance of um, uh, a realistic time allocated uh, for yourself to show the students how to do it and also for students to demonstrate learning. Um, this I like because often um, students need to come back to improve their work. Uh, digital technologies is about developing digital solutions and through feedback is when students have a chance. Now, always not it's not always possible, but at least once every teaching cycle, once a semester, or even once a year, when the students do a big DT project, 
give them the opportunity to get feedback and maybe have some time afterwards for them to go back and refine their work uh, in response to their feedback. It just makes that learning sink in and highlights to them the importance of feedback in their learning as well. Um, what are the expectations of accuracy in your task? If you're asking them to do something, um, is your assessment uh, expecting them to get everything correct? So again, some all of this uh, you would already know, but when you combine two learning areas, uh, there may be a little bit of a mismatch between what DT expects and what the other subject area expects. So considering what the balances are um, is uh, quite important. Breath versus depth, and I touched upon this before. Uh, the reality is uh, time is short. Uh, we are completely aware of that being uh, classroom teachers ourselves, uh, but giving students opportunities at times to go in depth with concepts is really important. Again, it's really hard to do all the time, but just be aware uh, that where possible, it'd be nice to do this. And if you can, um, give them model responses or templates. Uh, it supports the students that may completely be lost, uh, but it also allows them to be a little bit more self-motivated, self-driven, uh, and get a sense of that they can actually do this. So in Scratch, you might have seen the remix uh, button. That's absolutely wonderful. Uh, so giving them templates and saying, okay, uh, we want you to mo uh, modify these little parts of it, uh, and then your assessment um, rubric can uh, look at how students have remixed it. So if a student has just taken the basic project and added some superficial things, they might be at a certain level of achievement, whereas someone who's done significant amount of rework and really changed the functionality and added some more complexity uh, might be looking at a more higher level of uh, achievement in the, in the task. So, and this is the most important thing. I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, trying the activity or project yourself. Uh, if you're using drones in the classroom, if you're using micro bits, or if it's a sparrow, or even if it's getting students to do something in Excel, um, try the activity or project yourself. A, it gives you the confidence when you're in the classroom. B, you know where things might go wrong because you know the kinds of kids you have in your class. You know that um, Michelle might have difficulty with that. You might think that, you know, Alexandra is going to love this. What can I do to make this more exciting for her? So trying it yourself um, gives you the confidence and also gives you a sense of empathy in terms of what your students are going to face when they do this themselves. It's 5 or 3. Oh my goodness, I'm running late. So the last little thing we want you to do is we want you to switch on your annotations. Um, so it's just at the top. You've got your annotate um, button. And if you can pick a stamp, we just want to see where your understanding is. So we've got some misconceptions here. Um, if you think something is true, put a stamp in the true column. If you think it's false, put a stamp in the false column. Um, the first one is DT plus sec, X, STEM, STEAM. They're all the same thing, different acronyms. The next one is to do DT plus X well. Uh, it requires a strong knowledge of the curriculums being integrated. The third oh, one what is brilliant people we have, Sajatha. I know. Oh, look, this is lovely. You're all I realize, <laughs> Thank you. I realize we've gone a little bit over time, but hopefully, um, you know, you're all here. So hopefully you think that this is what the extra five or so minutes we've gone over. The third one is DP plus X requires students to do projects. Lovely. And the oh, last one, good DT plus X uh, really should have some programming or coding in it. The last one's a bit trickier. Mm. Oh. Oh, someone's hedging their bets. That's cheeky. <laughs> I love it. Love it. <laughs> okay, so well done. So absolutely, DT plus X, STEM, STEAM. Um, they're not exactly the same thing. Uh, what we want is authentic integration, but you could have STEM projects that have no digital technologies whatsoever. So our focus really this afternoon has been around um, putting the spotlight on digital technologies and finding good ways and authentic ways to connect it to other learning areas. So you'll notice that most of our ideas we presented, we haven't tied math, science, has PE, visual art, and digital technologies, because that's just superficial learning and we're just going to drive the kids mad if we try and do that. Great, the next one, absolutely, you do require a strong knowledge of the curriculum. Um, and if you don't have it yet, start, start somewhere, 
try teaching. Hopefully you have colleagues around you. Um, you know, if not, reach out to professional learning networks. Wherever you are in your state, there is um, competing teachers education associations, so reach out to them um, and get that support. Um, you can do really good DD plus X without doing projects. It might just be two lessons where you are combining um, certain concepts, but it makes sense to combine it because it makes sense for the students. And last one, um, DD plus X can be done really well with no programming. Remember, um, programming technically is one tenth of the curriculum. That's the implementation key concept. Um, so you can do things with data. You can do things with user interfaces, with algorithms. You can do really, really good and strong DT plus X learning um, where the students aren't writing a single line of code. So really think about what it is that you're trying to achieve there and make sure it always comes back to the curriculum uh, and the content descriptions in the curriculum. Um, Anna, have I, what have I forgotten here? No, Sajatha, you're all over it. I just wanted to add one thing and you did um, allude to it. When, you know, people like Sajatha and I, so for me, I taught for 22 years. I was really fortunate that I was in, I spent a lot of time on the same learning area uh, for many years, not the learning area, sorry, the year level. So if you are in a position to be on the same year level for um, a number of years, your curriculum knowledge of those learning areas at that particular juncture is going to be a lot stronger than someone who's had a year in year one, a year in year six, a couple of months in, you know, a different year level. So just be kind to yourselves and consider my mantra would be start small, start somewhere, but start Sorry, Anna. Has Anna frozen for everyone? Hello. Can you hear me? 